So where's technology going? I know that's a loaded question, which is why we have so many seats up here, because we need a lot of people to answer it. So to handle this discussion, I'm going to hand things over to the very well-equipped Liz Gans with All Things D. You're not on yet? Wow. Don't say on. Oh, that sounds more on. Yeah? Um, so my name is Liz Gaines. I'm a reporter with All Things D. I am delighted to have my now mic panel, panelists come up and join me. Um, we are going to talk about the future from a whole range of perspectives. Come on up. I'm not sure how important order is. You all have. Pick a seat. So I think that the technology of the future that I would like would be a self-driving car right now, right on my way getting here today. And I want everyone else on the highway to have that as well, um, <laughs> most importantly. Um, but these guys come from a, an interesting range of companies um, all over technology. And I think it'll be fun for them to blow our minds, hopefully a little bit, talking about what they're working on, what they know about that's interesting, and what they're hopeful about. And also what they think is kind of lame, but everyone just keeps talking about. Um, so let's start out just by getting to know them with, with uh, Lori first. Hi there, Lori Yoler. Um, have been an entrepreneur and investor in Silicon Valley for much of my career, and just recently joined Qualcomm as uh, SVP of Business Development, working for Peggy Johnson, who's being honored tonight. So very honored to be here. And I'm Marion Crook, and I've worked at at and Labs in research and development for almost it's over 30 years now. And uh, I've focused mostly on emerging technologies. I worked on the data side of the house when I think, I guess, 99% of my colleagues were working on the voice network. And so I've always been really intrigued with what's coming next. And now I have an organization, and that's all we're focused on. It's, and it's probably one of the biggest organizations in at and so that makes me excited. What's something you worked on 30 years ago? 30 years ago? Um, something called unified communications, believe it or not. <laughs> wow. um, we also worked on the video phone. <laughs> nice. My name is Navid Rezvani. I'm currently with CA Technologies. Most of you know it as uh, Computer Associates. Prior to CA, I was with NetApp for seven and a half years and Quantum Corporation in the storage uh, industry. Well, I'm working on project and portfolio management, agile tools, um, application performance management. So we've got a series of products at CA. And I'm really delighted to be here today. Hi, I'm Stephen Manley, not Michelle de Herto. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> and I am very intimidated right now. <laughs> So my, my job, uh, I'm, I'm the CTO for uh, EMC's Backup Recovery Systems Division. So again, you can think of us as the technology infrastructure that makes sure that your data is there when you need it. So that's, that's, that's what I do. I'm Catherine Ball. I'm actually a geneticist working at an internet company, which is a little bit different for me and very different for them. But um, I lead a small team of biologists who are developing a DNA test for Ancestry.com. Very cool. Why don't, why don't we start there? Talk about how <laughs> we can integrate <laughs> biology and technology. Can you, uh, how, how far along are you and how far might that go anytime soon? We're pretty far along. We've been running with the product that we have for just over a year. And well, I know people here don't think so, but biologists think we've been using technology for a long time. <laughs> and we've been doing a lot of big data stuff and, uh, and analyzing data using very much the same sort of model as real you know, particle physics people do. You take a lot of measurements over and over and over again, and it works. And so we've been doing this for a long what, time. What does that add up into? It adds up to signals you can trust. So one of the things that we're doing is allowing people like you and me just to spit into a tube. We use some of the uh, pretty cutting edge biological technology to measure your DNA that you're leaving in your spit. And we've got a bunch of very talented statisticians who write 
algorithms and talented computer scientists who make them run on the machines these guys are giving us. And then we'll able to give you guys a beautiful result. So it's a, it's a, Is that telling me who I'm related to? It'll tell you who you might be related to. It might tell where your ancestors might have come from in the world. And it puts you together with the people in our database that you are related to so you can collaborate to mm -hmm. find out more about your family history. Okay. Cool. Uh, so who has the thing that's the most unrelated to that? <laughs> Everybody, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, Marion. Well, I guess the, the thing that we're working on that you talked about earlier is machine-to-machine -machine communication, where we will have cars that drive themselves, which I initially thought of as ridiculous, but then when we actually started working on it, and it's really parking themselves and, and getting you out of tight, you know, accident-prone situations, so it, it is significant. Um, but a lot of it is more practical so that, uh, um, you know, you, you can talk to devices that are in your home through mobile tablets that you may have. So someone shows up on your doorstep, you, just, you can decide if you're going to, you know, send an alert to 911 or you're going to turn on the lights or you can actually open the door and let the person in. Um, and, and that's technology that's both practical, um, innovative, but something that I think you're going to have within your hands within six months, so it's exciting. And then there, there are other things that we're putting out into the market today, audio-visual techniques to use to help people explain bills that may be complicated, and it's all very personalized to you, so that if there's some issue that you have on your bill, you don't understand it, you can simply press a button and it will be explained to you. Um, if you have young children and, they, and you're teaching them how to read, they can look at Goldilocks and point to words and through a very natural sounding voice with the right intonations and cadence, they can have those words turn into actual stories um, with real characters. So that's, that's all very exciting and it's using the technology that we're using um, and building today and we're putting it out into the marketplace almost immediately, which I like. You, you know, before in, in Bell Labs, where I came from, there was a lag. So there'd be months and months, sometimes years, before the technology would emerge and we would actually have a product. And we've been able to cut that down to a matter of months and weeks by working very closely with innovation centers that we have within the labs. Go ahead. Uh, you know, one of the things that, in a, in a slightly similar vein, one of the things that really attracted me to Qualcomm and going back to a large company, having been in small companies, is their ability to take on really big, meaty, capital-intensive projects that affect everyone internationally and require a very big global standard and implementation all over the world. And Qualcomm, for those of you who don't know, is all about mobile and all about the really hard stuff inside your phone to make it an amazingly useful device inside your phone, inside your tablet, more and more inside your car, inside uh, some kind of wearable device. Uh, you know, we're even seeing innovation in, in little uh, devices that you're going to swallow that uh, have, a wireless, uh, have a wireless mode. Are you so, working on that too? Well, <laughs> Proteus is the company that obviously has been mentioned, but I think in healthcare, one of the reasons we're so excited about healthcare uh, is you're going to see a huge evol evolution in all of these new mobile devices that people wear around. And so one of the themes we have is the digital sixth sense, meaning wherever you are and whatever device you have, and whether or not you have your, your phone or any other device uh, closest to you, we want to bring the data and the context close to you. So we end up working on big things about location awareness, about context, about data everywhere and bringing computing power and the network closer to you with small cells. So lots of different, very big, broad uh, initiatives that- but Can you be more specific? Can you, what, what, what kind of applications are you guys working on that, would, that might blow our minds? So one of the, one of the projects that uh, Qualcomm Labs was working on for the last couple of years was around context awareness. And 
um, decided to apply it very recently to retail because they found that retailers were the most interested in very, very uh, close proximity to know exactly when you walk in the door of a, of a retailer or when you walk into the door of a museum and giving you a customized experience based on who you are securely, but giving an amazing experience using whatever mobile device that you have when you're in a shopping mood or when you're in walking through a museum or exploring an outdoor location or going to an event. And so to make sure that your context and the whole experience was really compelling wherever you were. So it was taking a, some very broad technologies like contextual awareness and lo location and making sure that it works across any device that you happen to be carrying, any industry standard, whether it's in Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or whether it's in cellular. And so it's kind of creating a really fantastic experience no matter what kind of mobile technology you're using. So, so very minority report, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Gesturing is big and all, all of that kind of uh, technology you're seeing more and more taken in. And I think science fiction movies and books are a great place to find out what we're going to get in the future because I think so many things we've been looking at are coming, like the self-driving car, like, you know, those are things we only <laughs> dreamed about, the Jetsons, uh, Jetsons style. So, mm -hmm. Is that true in uh, more enterprise technologies as well? Pretty much. Uh, I would say that one of the things that um, really attracted me to CA was with a lot of things that we've been hearing today about the big data, mobile, SaaS, DevOps. It's very rare that you can find one vendor that you can touch upon all of these and we have solutions for all of these areas. And all these trends are becoming a reality. And um, it is really important for a vendor to be able to provide not only the infrastructure, but an infrastructure that is secure and it can provide service quality, service assurance. And CA does that. We also have another product, it's called Eco Software. So in a lot of data centers, um, you know, with the theme being going green, we just want to understand how much power uh, we are consuming in our data centers. We can uh, have auditable trails for, to make sure that the companies are actually compliant with a lot of these green initiatives. So um, it's, it's really interesting to just kind of look at all of these going, you know, having the applications on mobile and all of that, so. But what's like the big leap that you're looking at right now? I mean, sorry, but I, compliance is not the most exciting no, thing I've No, it's, it's definitely <laughs> the big data and, and SaaS. Have just you ever been out at, of compliance? No, <laughs> I know, we'll Have talk you later. Been out of compliance? Being in compliance is super awesome. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> But I think uh, just transporting our portfolio into the SaaS, and uh, that's the future of IT management. Mm -hmm. So that's really uh, for a CEO to know exactly what their teams are working on. I was just talking to one of the CIOs for one of the small companies, said I had no idea my team in, in this other country, what they were working on, and I would ask them, okay, can you work on this next project? They would also always say, no, no, we're busy on this. Or, and now the tools that CA has can provide that level of uh, visibility and transparency. Mm -hmm. Last so, one up. So, so I guess, I guess I'm going to go with, I kind of view our job as to be incredibly boring. Um, <laughs> it, it, you know, we're, we're plumbers, right? I mean, what, what my company does, we build infrastructure. And just like your plumbing, you just want it to work. And, and so. But but you need it to work at scale so that you can you can analyze all, all your all your genetics or you can search for oil or you can you know handle things in the cloud. So so it's important to be boring, right? Because in the end, if if your infrastructure is exciting, that's a bad day. Right? I, <laughs> I, I spent the weekend trying to fix my toilet, which meant I spent a good chunk of today trying to find a plumber. Um, <laughs> After and then and someone to recarpet my house because it turns out I'm not a good plumber. Um, but uh, but but a lot of a lot of the focus you know that, that that you need to have in infrastructure, it's really exciting technology, that you want the customers to say yeah but that just works and 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 the impact on daily lives that that, that we can see a enabling other technologies but b. Anytime you can meet someone who said, you know, my job used to be I'd come in on the weekends and I was troubleshooting and I spent my entire life, you know, away from my family, away from my kids, just trying to, trying to make this stuff work. And, and, and they tell you, yeah, now I, now I get to leave work at 6 o'clock at night and I don't have to worry about things and I don't get, you know, paged in the middle of the night. 
That's really rewarding. So, so in some sense, all this big data, all this moving to the cloud, if you don't have the right plumbing underneath it, you know, everything else falls apart on top of it. So you know, we, we joke that our job is to be boring, but the truth is, like your plumbing, like your electricity, it's really, really hard problems. But if it just works, you should never notice. Not, not to shake this up too far, but if you look at if the question is where is the technology industry going, um, I'd be interested in your perspectives just on how do you feel like the industry and the way companies relate to each other, the way people at companies relate to each other, um, thinking about um, women in technology. Like, what do you think is most important now in changing about the technology industry, not just the technology itself? Um, one of the trends that we're beginning to notice um, when we look at the analytics of the network, and it's, it's, you know, my background is both in quantitative analysis as well as social psychology. So we're beginning to see a drop off in uh, private one to one communication. People just simply talking to each other, even texting to each other. And instead, you know, most of the communication is going on through social networks. So it's, it's group communication, it's collaboration and also through images. Um, so that's, uh, to me, that's a very profound shift. And it, it, it started happening last year, where, where most of the data was, was going in that direction. Is that a problem for a phone company? No, no, because we can stay on top of it. And, and you know, the, we're always inventing technologies to handle that type of, in fact, it's helpful for uh, communication companies because video demands more bandwidth and so there are more networks and you know there are cost models that will work out so that it's profitable but i do think it's profound in terms of just the nature of social engineering and what's happening and, and what what is driving that change and what it will mean for the coming generation will, you, will they be more collaborative and 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 group oriented or will they be socially awkward and not able to really communicate well. What do you think? I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping, because I do have three children in their young 20s, so I'm hoping it means that they're more collaborative, but I do sit there many times and all they're doing is just clicking away <laughs> and not communicating. So, well, not communicating verbally in a way that I can hear them. So, the, the one thing that I'm hoping is that um, vid c c video conferencing for consumers, I'm hoping that that improves because that technology um, is unreliable, it's, the resolution's not very good, and 80% of communication is nonverbal. So if you're, if you're not really able to see the person and understand what the emotion is in the, in the verbal communication, it's, it's problematic. So we're doing everything that we can within my organization to improve that. So the resolution's better, there's high definition voice, so you can actually hear the connotation of what someone is saying. Um, so I think that will help. I hope that will help. Yeah, I mean, now you take that question and take it to the whole cultural level of the impact <laughs> of technology. Yes. I was gonna say, I mean, as, as someone who's been on things like fancy Cisco telepresences and, mm -hmm. and whatnot, I have to admit, other than you know, making it much harder for me to make faces at the person on the other line or you know, do something else, I still feel like video doesn't give me the connection. Right? Right. There's, there's a connection sitting here with, with you, with Naveed, with everybody else, that if we were all behind screens, yes. it, it still feels, it, no matter how high the resolution is, I'm not sure that changes things. Do, do, do you see that ever being bridged, or, or is it always going to be sort of a, a second-class citizen to being in the same room? Together? Telepresence helps over the, you know, the interactive private communication that you see on, on video chat, but I definitely agree with you. There's something that's missing. Hmm. It, it does help to see the actual facial expression and to be able to hear the, the voice a bit better. Um, but there is something missing, and, and we're trying very hard to get that emotional connection there yeah. as well. But you can imagine the challenges. So, so we're animals, though. Yeah. So we do have, we get a lot of information from real contact yes. that we cannot get 
electronically at a distance. Yes, and just to calm yeah. someone down sometimes in a business meeting, yeah. you, you want to touch them, yeah. and you can't yeah. do that. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, one of the other cultural things that I think is happening that has been so healthy and certainly involves the media industry and the part of the disruption in the media industry is transparency in companies. I think social media is just one little piece, but we have moved towards transparency. And if a company is being a bad actor or an individual or a board member or a company culture is rotten, you have things like Glassdoor where people are very comfortable talking about what's happening. And so things are real time and transparent and so we have an amazing knowledge. So we're going to know if there's a bad plumber because we can look up his, sure. his information online. So the overall transparency about business ethics, about personal ethics is so healthy. And you act, I think you're going to see, hopefully, over time, some new players being given opportunities, both in senior management and on boards, because people who have been bad actors and have been able to hide for a long period of time in companies large and small, I think we're going to have transparency. And certainly, the younger generation is all about transparency. There's question about whether they share too much and whether there is no privacy. But I think it's very interesting, this huge shift we have towards people wanting to work in a company with a healthy culture and with people who treat each other with professionalism or, you know, or fun. you don't fun think people are just saying that? You think that's true? You're I, this, you know, we look at the transparency we're finding out about companies and, and company cultures. We find out very quickly. You know, doctors are even being rated online. There is just this amazing system of rating people much more frequently and sharing information about, with each other. One of the things I love about Silicon Valley is I can call someone and say, hey, is this someone I would want to be associated with or be on a board with or be in a company with? And, and you know, the, I think the online tools just help that sharing happen even more frequently. I, I, I think from our point of view, one, one of the things, you know, interviewing people and whatnot and, and looking at potentially companies to buy and, and, and working with other people, I think one thing that, that I've seen today that I saw a lot less of 15 years ago is really value on the emphasis, emphasis of storytelling. So, you know, once upon a time, I'd come in with a really cool technical idea, and I would hope someone would pick up on it and run with it. But the technology was sort of the end goal. I, I think a lot of what we're seeing today, and especially as we move into these big data areas, what story does the data tell me? What does it uncover? What is it, how do I connect with real people and say, yes, this means something, right? And, 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 and you know, We've got a lot of customers who obviously work with big data, and it is exactly like the Ancestry.com. All right, you're spitting in the thing and you're getting some DNA out, but the story that comes out of it is, it turns out I knew that there's this guy who lives across the country, and it turns out that we're related and we found out and we went on a trip to Ireland together. Right, and, right that's so much you know, more interesting than the spreadsheet. Yeah. And, 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 Don't say and, bad things about spreadsheets, they're great. Honestly, put down everything. <laughs> But, but, I, but I think it's a real shift, and, and I think it's important in everything from when people interview uh, to, to be remembered that you have to be able to spin stories to if you're starting a company, you have to be able to tell stories to if you're just inside a large company and you're trying to affect change. I think if you don't come up with a narrative, it's a lot harder to connect to people now than it used to be because there's so much more information swirling. If you don't connect to us as, as storytelling animals, Raw data is a lot harder to get in front of people and, and get them to pay attention to. Do you think that the technology industry is any closer or further away from the cutting edge of science and research? I mean, Marin, you were saying that you feel that research is a lot more connected to products now, but then also you're kind of thinking about your research from a business um, lens. And then, I mean, Catherine, you're talking about feeling a little bit like an outsider in IT because you're coming from biology. I mean, do you think that those things are coming together or that? Um, are tech people deluding themselves into thinking they're on the cutting edge when reality, like, you know, over at the university next door, it's much further along? I think with, with respect to the big data and the amount of data that we're dealing with, uh, we have to be very careful. I think that's one area that, um, you know, we keep talking about it. And there's a lot of data that is available. I was looking at the little cartoon thing that said that they have shown that uh, um, the people that were struck by lightning, they also have cats. I mean, the correlation there, I mean, you really have to be careful. There is a lot of information out there, right? What do you do with that information? And I think that's one area that is going to be really challenging and remains to be challenging to tell the story, to be able to kind of come up with the story and say, this is, this is how you connect the dots. 
Do you have a cat? Uh, no. <laughs> so I'm, you're safe. I was going to say, I, no cat, never been struck by lightning. It must be true. But, but I, I think I the approach too. is different. I mean, when you think about the way uh, industry works, the, there is there's a point. You want to de deliver something. In the end, there's a product. You deliver the product. You get paid. And then you start thinking about the next generation product. With science, you want to not deliver something. You want to discover something. And it's a completely different metric. And the process by which you do it is called the scientific method. It's the best one ever. But it's very different from product development. And putting those two um, processes together takes some determination and some understanding. But I think it's possible, and I think it's rewarding, and I do think it's important. And when we see a lot more people who have been well-trained in the scientific method coming into the technology companies and saying, we can prototype faster if we experiment hard first. Mm -hmm. And I think that is happening. But it's about a, an approach and a philosophy, and I think that's a great thing. But, well, I, I would say, you know, as, as someone who, who came up a little bit through the academic side of computer science, which, you know, the old, you know, I'll hear the old joke, if you have to put science after it, it's not. But um, I, I do think one of the things that really worries me about the tech industry is that 15, 20, 25 years ago, research in computer science was much more interesting, right? It was much more aggressive. It was the creation of Unix at AT&T at, at AT Labs. It was, you know, there were great things coming out of Carnegie Mellon and Stanford and Berkeley. And, and in a lot of ways, you know, to get funding, I've seen a lot more universities do small incremental research as opposed to the big idea research. And, and if you look across the university scene, both, both internationally and domestically, in the, in the technology, in the computer science specific technology areas, I, I think we really have lost a lot of that shooting for big things, and it's turned into shooting for small things so I can continue to get funding. And, and that's an area that really worries me, because I, I do think that we'll eventually see that, you know, the, the, the lack of big ideas coming in. Maybe it'll come in from physics, maybe it'll come in from biology, but, but I, I do see across computer science research across the universities, it's gotten, I think, much less forward-looking than it was even 15 years ago. I think the good news is, though, the large companies are stepping in to take those bigger bets. So maybe yeah. it's not going to be in the universities. I will say I think the Public Library of Science taking academic publications and putting them online for free to let the whole world access is, is a positive thing. But I'm also seeing large companies saying, all over the place. I need innovation centers across the world. Yeah, I need to be true. able to reach out to innovators no matter where they are in the company. Um, you know, I know it, from my experience at Qualcomm, they look for every employee to be an entrepreneur and innovator and to have an idea and make sure that they have a place to pull in all those ideas and support them and iterate with them and develop on them and realize that the big ideas can come from anywhere, inside or outside the company, and there has to be a way to evaluate those and make sure that the best ones rise to the top and get funded, much like a venture capitalist would. Yeah, and that, I mean, that can also be networked, too, like you're talking about. I mean, I was just uh, speaking earlier today with this, uh, the CEO of a company called ResearchGate based in Berlin, where people share, um, it's like a, science, a social network for scientists where you share your data sets. And so um, the founder's point is, you know, previously people would only publish when they found a positive result, but there's so much more data that exists that could be useful to other people from abandoned studies, from studies that didn't come up with anything. And by having a networked approach to that, people can learn from each other. And they, you know, I think they just discovered some new yeast based on some data from um, uh, in, somewhere in Africa that an Italian researcher found um, access to based on that. I will get the details more straight before I write about it tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> what's, what's, the, what's the biggest idea you've heard lately? Um, Lori and I were just at the D conference last week where um, Elon Musk was telling us about this kind of um, air hockey board that he's going to set up between LA and San Francisco so we can get out of the expensive and uh, wasteful and slow high-speed rail plan that we have right now. Wow. That's definitely a biggie. That would be a, that was the that was the biggest one I've heard in the in the last week. But I, I I go back to personalized medicine and healthcare. I still think we've barely scratched the surface. You know, there's and there's so many areas to innovate in healthcare. And I I, I you know consumers really care, but doctors also care. They want to evolve and give better care. And we're moving from 
a place where, as someone described it, medical records were these hieroglyphics that only one guy could read and the nurses couldn't even read to trying to really share information and figure out a way that if somebody does want to wear, I don't have my uh, jawbone up on right now, but if somebody does want to wear this or they want to do their own testing at home or they want to do whatever, they get to be empowered to use whatever I think we're going to see a lot of additional wearable devices, as, as we heard of. And I think there's just going to be so much innovation in that area. It's a big data problem, so we're going to need the plumbing from uh, <laughs> this group here. So it's actually a perfect representative group, because it's going to have to be mobile. We're going to have to have the, the real medical research behind it, but we're also going to have to have the plumbing in place to make sure that when we take all those real-time measurements of whatever it is, yeah, that we're not we can, just an island of our yeah. own data, not not getting any insight out of and it. And it'll need to be compliant. Uh, that's yes. right, that's <laughs> right. Don't yes. forget about that. <laughs> we, we've actually started a trial with a, a, a medical center in Houston, in, in, in uh, Texas, where people are wearing, you know, cuffs for their blood pressure. And they have scales that are um, wirelessly and securely connected to, you know, things in a doctor's office. And if things look problematic, then there's this automatic video session that's set up so that there can be a two-way communication and mm -hmm. you can look at the visual signs of the person. So I do agree. I think the innovation is mostly going to come in healthcare because that's where it's going to be needed because of the aging of the population. Mm -hmm. well, I think that's also okay. because of the economics of healthcare. Yes, exactly. Right? When the the vast majority of healthcare money is spent on very few sick people, and over the course of a person's life, it's really just those last few months where we actually cost anything. Yeah. And so anything we can do to mediate the, those chronic diseases, those long lingering horrible deaths, anything we can do to mitigate that and decrease the suffering is going to be good. So measurements that will say, you're about to have a stroke, how about you sit down and call the doctor? It would yes. be very nice. And there are a lot of people who are getting the, you know, the Fitbits or the other cuffs. Exactly. And they communicate electronically, but the problem is that we also need to understand how your own personal physiology and your genetics and your family history all work into what your personal risk is. And yeah, that's going to be think fun. That in a way, technology is kind of becoming more human because it's pervading so many aspects of our mm -hmm. life that you can't get away from a privacy question. You can't get away from like a self-control issue. Should I really be like, you know, looking at my phone while I'm driving now? No, stop it. You know, <laughs> like you, you actually have to think these things through because they're available to you at all times and you can be connected everywhere. Or the scale that tweets your weight. Not a fan of that one. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what, other, what other things are you not a fan of? What, 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 what do you think is, is just overhyped, is not, is not near-term interesting or potentially even long-term interesting? So, no insult at all to you, but I think <laughs> smartphones are overhyped. I mean, I think you're... I think Can I take yours away tonight? You'll be fine without <laughs> it. I know, I was going to say. I'm so glad when I lose it for about 10 minutes. But, you know, I have this picture of the first mobile device, and it was like in 1948, and it fit in the, the trunk of a car. You had to have the base that station. That was what mobile was. Yeah, that was, and people were so excited about it. You know, that was the innovation. And I just think five years from now, we'll, we'll, we'll laugh at the way smartphones and PDAs are designed. Because it'll be an implant? Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if it will be an implant, but it will be things like, I think, self-charging batteries, so you won't have to keep charging them. I think the design will be very different. The engineering will be. Um, it, it, it's, I mean, I'm That's so That's still grateful. a smart mobile device, though, so we're, yes. we're, uh, we're singing from the same it needs tune. A chip. Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely need chips and much more intelligent chips as well. But I, I do think that's where a lot of the hype is. But it will change. It will have to change. Yeah. I think the big thing that I think is overhyped, pardon me, is actually big data. Yeah. Is living in Silicon Valley, where I've been living for a very long time, it is all about building the infrastructure or the plumbing or whatever. And then 
I think we risk that if you build it, they will come mentality. And I'm showing my age. It's from a movie, Field of Dreams. But, <laughs> but that's not necessarily true that if you build the infrastructure, that somebody's going to do something smart with it. That's absolutely, completely the wrong assumption. We're going to come up with conclusions about cats cause lightning strikes. They cause a lot of bad things, but it's not <laughs> lightning strikes. So I, I do think that without the um, hand in hand ability to actually do some math, to think about statistics, to understand the data that you are trying to do something with, the, the whole big data thing is going to be a sad and expensive failure. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with, with you, Kathy. I, I don't really think any particular. I thought you were the particular... one talking about how data no, is great. I, no, data no. are great. They <laughs> are great. <laughs> Having data is, is great. But I, I don't really think anything is overhyped mm, because exactly. any of these new trends, they're byproduct of uh, some business needs or technology innovation. But big data is, is an area that just throwing computing power at it is not going to get us anywhere, right? We just need to be smart about it. We need to really rely on they're asking the right questions and for scientists and engineers to go off and get those answers. You know, and it requires some level of organizational maturity that will take time to get there, I so, think. So, so I'll, I'll disagree. I, I actually think, well, I mean, the big data company is my job, but, um, <laughs> but, 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 but I actually think, you know, you know big data is probably underhyped in the sense that what we're looking at right now, the way people look at it is, oh, it's a bunch of data and it's more compute, and maybe I can go look for needles and haystacks. I, I think that version of big data doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. right? I think the version of big data that makes sense is there's so many haystacks and so many needles if I can automatically start to find possible correlations, if I can really start to get smarter about understanding what's going on, looking at that data automatically, then I can really start to do interesting things. Human beings are good at many things. We're good at telling stories. We're good at connecting. We're, we're, we're good at sharing information. We're lousy at analyzing large piles of information. And I think as we teach these systems, not just to hold the data, not just to have more compute, but to be able to really start to pull together the stories, to get adaptive algorithms, to really, you know, finally realize some of the, the principles of, of artificial intelligence that started at Stanford in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and really start to apply that now that we have big enough data sets and enough compute power, I think that's when things start to get interesting. So I, I think if you're just looking at it as the infrastructure part necessary but not sufficient, but the interesting company, you know, there's a lot of fascinating companies that are saying, it's not your job to go ask the right question, because when big data is valuable, it's, it's when it's telling you the question you should have been asking in the first place. And if, and if I'm going to put one thing that I think is overhyped, not to, you know, roll back to the beginning, I do think a lot of these sort of, again, video conferencing type of things, I, I got to admit, again, beyond where we were, it's not that different than being on the phone for me. And so, what? <laughs> <laughs> Feedback yeah. is he doesn't okay. have grandkids. Uh, technically, <laughs> technically, well, technically I have kids and grandkids, but that's a long story. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and, 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 and again, you know, it's different, I mean, when, 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 I, when I see my son or my daughter or, or one of my grandkids on a video phone and then I come home from a business trip after a week, you know what they say? We haven't seen you for a week. They don't say, oh. So it's not the same. There is not, it's not the same as giving your kid a hug. It's not the same as tackling your son and rolling him down the stairs and apologizing to your wife for breaking his arm. It's, you, just, you can't do that on a video phone. I'm not saying I did that. Come on, Stephen. Child Services said that it was probably an accident. Did any of you guys see this thing that came out a couple weeks ago that's like, um, some young technologists came out of the Y Combinator program. Um, they're really sick of food. They think it's inconvenient. You have to cook it. You have to, you know, think, remember to eat. Um, so they invented this like uh, slurry smoothie shake called, get this, Soylent. Um, <laughs> not a joke, as far as I can tell. Um, I mean, yes, a joke, but um, that you can 
you, you know, it, it provides for you, it comes in thousand calorie servings and you, you know, you just eat it at, drink it at times during the day and then you never have to think about this inconvenient thing of food and human awesome. interaction and restaurants and cooking and shopping and, you know. <laughs> You're all yeah, for it. not to have to worry about that sex thing either. <laughs> 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 it's not going to be crazy now. <laughs> it's with you with the food thing. I think only a busy, very busy a computer science uh, student well, is going to think they want to get yes. rid of the, the joys of being human. And one yes. of them is actually eating food that's not people. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, but there's eat to live and live to eat people, yeah. right? I mean, so, so I, I mean... I, Although, yeah, you know, con convenience is back, healthy. though, right? You're seeing the meal delivery services again, and you're seeing uh, concierge yeah. services yeah. popping up again. So convenience is back, and people don't have time, and I don't get a thrill from going to the grocery store. I just, you know, once in a while, but all the time, the routine, I think. So you have seen the food industry trying to be creative again, and it's, but it's healthier this time and it's more convenient. So I, I think you are, you, I, I am seeing investors investing in new food concepts all over the world. So it's a, it seems to be the venture industry has moved away from some of the really capital intensive plumbing types of issues and to stuff closer to the app layer in our world, but they're also moving into food and it's, it's kind of an interesting concept. So I think you're gonna see a lot of interesting new funded concepts in the food industry. So food, not quite as interesting as healthcare, but <laughs> Not as capital intensive, easier to easier to do. But you're seeing, you know, some restaurants being funded and new concept. You're seeing a resurgence of new foods too, new convenient foods that are being funded. Navi, did you want to say something? No, no. I was just. I, I would that. agree, though, that there is a coldness to technology. You know, it, it is bringing us together through social media, but are we really, Connected. really? Connected, as you were pointing out, we're you know we're talking, but I don't know how much communication well, is truly we're going human, on. Right? So. Yeah. I think we're going to try to wrap up early in the interest of allowing you all to drink some nice wine. Um, <laughs> but uh, is it, does anyone have a burning question? There was a question over there. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I, my name is Lillian Cordova, and I work at Qualcomm, and um, I just wanted to make a point about the big data. I work in. Um, portfolio and program management, and we have an information management program that is reliant on a lot of analytics, uh, specifically predictive analytics that use big data, and I think a lot of the um, social media is really reliant on the data that comes out of that in order to really monetize their business. So I think there's a lot that, that is really, you know, um, important to to that and it's reliant on the infrastructure so i think that it's you know really complementary to that i like you <laughs> <laughs> one more go ahead so i don't know how many of you have seen mary meeker's latest slides but um it shows that 1997 um, uh, cartoon that says on the internet, nobody knows your dog, and then the current one, which is on the internet, everybody knows your dog. <laughs> and um, one of the things I was thinking about, I'm wondering if you could, uh, all of you, but if you could in particular um, comment on this is, so I've done the 23andMe thing, and it was really fascinating to see the data, but one of the unintended consequences, all of a sudden people are contacting me who, who are, have slight relation, and, and, and another unintended consequence I know from other people, not myself, where they have both found out that people they didn't know were close relatives are, and people they thought were close relatives are not. And it gets one to thinking, you know, I didn't think about it, that now my genetic data is in a database, could get hacked, and what happens when insurance companies say, oh, it isn't only your your medical records you have to bring, but we're gonna look at your DNA before we decide how much to charge you. Or if you look mm. at like progressive insurance and their move now to use telematics to decide how, yeah. whether you're a good driver or not. I'm just wondering how each of you think yeah. about the sort of the unintended collateral damage from this vast amount of da data that can now be correlated. And if you think there's something we each, each either as individuals or our governments or what should we do about this, if anything? Or is it just a tide, forget about it. You know, it's gonna happen. I think with respect to genetic testing data and your medical records, we actually have fairly good protections within this country 
you're not allowed to discriminate on the basis of your genetic testing in order to get health insurance. Um, you're not allowed to disclose health information if you're a health care provider. We have pretty good protection. Nonetheless, one should be cautious because laws can be changed, right? Um, what we don't have a really good understanding of is all the other data that we are leaving about ourselves all over the place, our spending habits, where our bodies have been with our cell phones in our pocket the whole time, um, who we've been with, how long we were there, all those things. There's a lot of information that's out there that people are right now taking advantage of because it's really interesting data. Mm -hmm. But we have not really thought about it very well or carefully as a society, I agree. I, I would tend to agree, I, I, but I think as with all things, the next generation will assume that whatever seems scary to us is an inevitability. <laughs> I do think it's a tide. And you know, I, I often, whether I'm online or I'm going anywhere, I, I remember my mother's advice, which is, whatever you're doing, assuming I'm, assume I'm watching you. <laughs> <laughs> whatever I'm doing, they're tracking me. My mom will eventually be able to log in and say, why were you in that part of Oakland? <laughs> so. I have a question. Hi, Marjan from EMC. Um, I don't know if I can articulate it as well as um, NPR did. Go ahead. <laughs> articulate. <laughs> go, go. Yeah. So um, NPR had um, a very interesting uh, program on uh, basically a research that was done that the um, United States has become um, very forward in terms of social media where you know all the Facebook, the Twitters, and the little um, applications that are basically popping out of everywhere from you know even college students who are doing a lot of that. And in return, um, it was saying that basically in United States culture is to embrace that and it's actually feeding into that social. It's basically a subculture, an underground culture that was never really accepted and is becoming more acceptable. And now we're importing scholars from Europe. So like there's German scientists and there's like, uh, you know, this Jewish, you know, from Israel who just invented something, at, you know. So, but on the other hand, um, it had a very interesting argument about the fact that we as a country are producing the big guns and the big airplanes. And what we've done is we're not interested in how many shoes we're making as an, as, it's mostly about our infrastructure. But so when, when you look at technology, I feel like, you know, I, I agree with a lot of you who are saying, we don't really know where this is going, but somehow, some way, I feel like this social and subculture is embracing that, the big data. It's like, it's just becoming a different twist. So what you were saying, Steve, about, you know, it's not the AT&T labs and the, the sexy, you know, photos of 70s we look at with these scientists in the IBM labs, but it's more like these, the subculture that wasn't, you would never have thought of to be the innovators. I wasn't sure if you guys have heard, like, is it, there, I really think that scientifically, basically the program was saying that scientifically we are importing and we're exporting these, you know, sexy social media kind of science. No, I, I, certainly one of the things that drives me crazy um, is, and, and this, this spans, you know, gender and, and, and it's been the last 15, 20 years, even in an economic downturn, I do not understand why we have so few college graduates in the sciences, whether it's computer science or physics or biology or math. It's absolutely mind-boggling. And, and, and I know I, shouldn't, I should support the humanities and all this sort of stuff, but I do not understand why the United States continues to produce such a low percentage of students in the sciences. And to me, it means that we're almost forced to, to brain drain and import intelligence from other countries. And, and I'm fine with that, other than I don't understand why culturally in this country we're not creating, creating more scientists. It, it absolutely boggles my mind. Investment in education, we're not really making that investment, right? Speak up. In, investment in ed education. I mean, mm -hmm. we do have, we, we live in Silicon Valley, a lot of us do. We have a lot of big companies here, but yet our teachers are the lowest paid, you know, individuals in the society. So it's definitely an area that we need to really pay attention to to grow more, more talent and attract people into science and engineering. And, yeah. I, think, I think living in a life of science and engineering and technology means living, at least professionally, in a certain amount of discomfort 
forever. But you are never going to get a, a giant pat on the back and a raise saying, that's it, job well done, phew, you're done. <laughs> right? That's never going to happen. So you, you all, always, always, always are just going to be a little bit uncomfortable. You're always going to say, I could have done better. I must do better. I have to try harder. I need to re-educate. I need to keep learning. And it's that level of discomfort I think we as a society are not applauding. Mm -hmm. We're saying you should be satisfied with yourself. You should be happy with your work when you go home. You should actually go, ooh, tomorrow. I can't wait to fix what I did today. But that's the, I think there is a hunger to do better that we are not necessarily instilling very well. And I think everyone in the room who's a parent or even not has, has an opportunity to both uh, encourage and mentor others who are considering going into science. And I, I've met so many students who are thinking about it and say that nobody kind of pushes that, them in that direction. And since we are in a room of women, a lot of the women I've talked to said they were told, you know, okay, it's okay to get an undergraduate degree in science or technology, but then you should go MBA school, law school, whatever, and not continue on to your PhD. And so I think it's really important to keep pushing people if they have the aptitude and interest in science, let them know it's actually okay to continue in their education in a science or technology degree. And that, and that there'll always be a tension between technology and science. You know, you, you do the invention and then someone immediately will want to know, well, how do we make money out of that? So that, that's what you live with, and you, you just have to accept that. All right, I think we're about to be herded off the stage. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. No, this was, this was fantastic. I think it's a huge topic, so obviously there's a lot to talk about here. And uh, the last point, if you want to talk about STEM, or should I say STEAM, for those of you who want to add art into the mix, <laughs> then let's have that discussion during the reception. So thank you all so much. This was a great discussion. Round of applause.